All right, so before we begin, I would just like to state for the record that today is September 14th, 2022, and my name is Ben Bauman, and I'm speaking here in Indianapolis, Indiana, with John Ruckel's House III, and we are doing an interview for the Indiana Legislative Oral History Initiative. So just starting off, when and where were you born? March 15th, 1959, Indianapolis, Indiana. Okay, and uh, what were your parents' names? Jack and Patricia Ruckelhaus. Okay. When did your family move to Indiana? Oh, gosh, Ben. Uh, they, well, my parents both were native of Indiana, so okay. we would be going back. I can't remember what generation would be, but it would be several generations right. from there removed that they would have moved from wherever yeah. to here. Okay. Don't know. Okay. <laughs> don't know. Just know why we've been living here all of our lives. Right. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Uh, what were your parents' occupations? So my mother was a homemaker, and then my father was an attorney and a former state senator. Yeah, okay. And uh, do you have any siblings? I do. I have one older sister who is now deceased, Lucinda. Okay. And then I have a middle sister, Jackie, who is still with us. Okay. And how would you describe your childhood? Oh, very normal. Um, Meridian Kessler area growing up. Uh, sort of the St. Joan of Arc. Uh, then I went to, went to school 70, did a little tour at Park Tudor School, ended yeah. up at Pike High School. So I've seen them all, public, <laughs> private, and parochial. Yeah. And uh, during the formative years around the uh, Central Avenue area in St. Joan of Arc, rode our bike to the Rivy and to the wow. drugstore and all that and, and walked to school. One yeah. of the few that walked to school. That's cool. Okay. Um, Who would you say were the most influential people in your childhood? Oh, gosh. I would say, obviously, teachers come to mind. Uh, Pike High School, I was very uh, fortunate to have multiple good teachers there there, and and administrators, I might add. And at uh, St. Joan of Arc, the nuns, the nunnery. I was very strong back then. That was back in the late 60s, sort of the height of Catholicism and Catholic education. We had 50 kids in each class. Wow. So the nuns were judge, trial... And executioner with discipline. And they were <laughs> swift, and I was warranted when they came my way. Wow, okay. <laughs> so what did you know about your family's political beliefs growing up? A lot. So yeah. grew up in a family that had been very active in politics over multiple generations. And most in front of me, of course, was my father, who's a two-term state senator. Uh, very much law and order. He was conservative, but he was more of a fiscal conservative, Mm -hmm. if you will. And then his brother, my uncle, William D. Ruckelhaus, who had a multiple layered career, both at the state level as well as the federal level. And he was an environmental uh, steward, uh, if you will. And he was also conservative, obviously, for fiscal and probably more moderate on the social issues. Yeah, okay. And so you had a, yeah. So what did you. What were the interactions like then with your dad and your uncle when you were talking about politics as a kid? Did you feel like you were more politically aware than your peers growing up? or Yeah, mainly in awe. So I, I was really privileged in that respect to be exposed at a very early age when most of the other kids worried about how good they were at football, how good they were at basketball, or in chasing girls. I was running around the state with my uncle when he was running for the United States Senate in 1968. Yeah. And had several interactions with my dad when he was in the Senate. Not much, because I was pretty young. After that, he was in the Fraternal Order of Police lawyer for both the state as well as the nation. So, again, that law and order background was was very important. Then he was a member of the Indianapolis City Council. So I remember watching him and all with Bill Hudnut, who was mayor, and then obviously Dick Luger prior to that, the interactions with them. So had a real rich exposure, not only to central Indiana, Indianapolis, but to the entire state. And then the nation as well, when Bill went on to become the first EPA director, uh, director of the FBI, assistant U.S. Attorney General. And there's a real theme here, Ruckelhouses can't hold a job, so... (laughs) So, I mean, did you aspire as a kid then to be to get into politics? Yeah, I did. I really did. I, I really, coming up in that background, I guess it would be analogous if you, Mickey Mantle, you're the son of Mickey Mantle. Why right. not? Why would you not want to be a baseball player, yeah. right? Sure. But no, I really had great mentors and great role models and being exposed to that whole process. And, and really what, at the end of the day, what got me going was I saw at a ground level, what they could do to help people, either collectively or individually. 
And that really motivated me. And both what Bill did at a national level and what my dad did, primarily at the state level and at the local level, it really motivated me to get involved. So, yes. Yeah. All right. Now, how did you view Indiana growing up? I mean, obviously, I suppose you had traveled around the country a bit, given your uncles, you know, uh, in the Nixon administration and stuff like that. You know, what was Indiana to you? Well, it was everything. And, and, and honestly, to my parents, I guess I look back on it, maybe they were cheap, right? We, we didn't travel that much. We okay. really didn't. So my uncle was, yeah, he went to Washington, yeah. and then he took his family to Washington. So we'd go to Washington from time to time. Sure. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed that, and that was kind of the other end of the planet, if you will. Yeah. So between Washington, D.C. and Indianapolis, that was really it, other than oh, maybe an occasional Florida vacation for a spring break. Sure. Uh, Indiana was uh, really where I spent 99.9% .9 of my time. Yeah, okay. And so did you think, like, Indiana is like a... Like a, like a special state in the United States to you? Or? You sure did, because that's your whole point of reference, mm -hmm. your whole focus at that point. Uh, never really aspired to go to the coasts. Yeah. Never really aspired to go to Europe at that time. That was something that was so far away. And yeah. No, it's just really Indianapolis was in, in Indiana. And again, having that exposure with my uncle and traveling the state in in. In, uh, 1968, when literally, if you think about it, the campaigning back then, there was no real advertising and certainly not an internet at that point. Right. And so literally you went around and the candidate spoke at the courthouse square every weekend and I would be right by his side. And so that was, that was the world to me. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so now when did you go to college and what was your major? So I went to college at Indiana University, and I started in 1978 and then graduated in 1982, so graduated on time, Yeah. and I double majored in political science and history, and that was interesting how I got there to the extent that political science was a natural articulation. I thought I was going to go to law school. I'm, you can follow up on that question here in a second, yeah. I'm sure, but... Um, Thought I was going to do that. I enjoyed political science, but I was taking a few classes in history and fell in love with history. Yeah. So I double majored in history, and had I had to do it all over again, I would have probably singularly majored in history for a couple of reasons. One, I just love history. And then number two, it was very interesting back in the day. This is really just outside of the window of the Vietnam War, and the political science professors then were very akin and hated Richard Nixon and equated me with my uncle and Richard Nixon, so they made life miserable on me. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, it was very interesting. I mean, it, yeah, it's to see how like political legacies and families right. affect the, the descendants, you know, that's, um, that is interesting. Right, right. Um, so... Jumping a little bit, so did you like try to, I mean, how did you respond to something like that when someone's bringing up like your family's, you know, political history and, and putting that on you, um, you know, what, what do you do? Oh, I situation? remember like it was yesterday. So this would have been in probably about 1981 and I had Professor Katz, who is a political science professor, brilliant, mm -hmm. just brilliant pro political science professor, but clearly not a Nixon lover at that point in his okay. life. Yeah. And so he would constantly give references to Richard Nixon during his lectures and then would single me out and pepper me with questions. And finally, one day <laughs> I stood up in class. I said, Professor Katz, you're one of the best professors I've ever had, but I didn't serve in the Nixon administration. <laughs> I don't even know Richard Nixon. Oh and then gosh. he backed off, and he yeah. was great. I mean, it was a, it was a good, it was a friendly give and take. Yeah. But he was very animated in his uh, disdain for former President Nixon. Yeah. That's for sure. That's funny. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. So, what extracurricular activities were you involved in when you were in college? So, when I was at IU, I was in the Sigma Chi fraternity, and I was in a dorm first year, and then joined the Sigma Chi fraternity, and I became very active for a little while in the fraternity itself. Uh, I always laugh and tell this joke. It's not a joke, but I was actually uh, showed up my senior year with a rather large car with a huge trunk, and I became assistant social chairman overnight only because my car held five kegs of beer with the trunk closed. That's the only reason why I got <laughs> oh active gosh. there. But really, I was active with the Inner Fraternity Council, so what's called the IFC. So that is a body that is a governing body of all the fraternities, and that's 
there's a reciprocal for the women in the sororities. And so I was either vice, one term as vice president of the IFC, and then one term as what's called the attorney general. Okay. So my job as the attorney general was the guy that would go around to the fraternities when the fraternities would get in trouble for whatever reason. And believe me, I was a busy guy at IU <laughs> in this role and try to work with, be the representative of the fraternity with the administration to try to help the fraternities mitigate the damage of whatever they did. Yeah. Okay. That's funny. <laughs> Um, so what were your goals then after graduating from undergrad? So I really thought, Ben, thank you for asking about that. So clearly the government service was omnipresent in the back of my mind. I thought I wanted to go to law school, but meanwhile I was in a family business. So my mother is a carter. So mm-hmm. the Carter Lee Lumber Company, a family business mm-hmm. literally just down the street from where we are right now at the state library. Was uh, I was fifth generation, so all during high school, and I even worked there during some during grade school. But we'll make sure that the Department of Child Labor doesn't know that now, right? <laughs> Hopefully, the statute of limitations is right run out. <laughs> but I worked there all the way through high school, all the way through college during the summers, all my spring breaks. Again, we didn't travel. Yeah. I just worked, and I loved that. I loved the lumber business. So I was moving into business, and we were up about $50 million in sales, 125 employees. I was a fifth generation with my two cousins, and I loved it. And so I thought about going to law school and applied even, took the LSATs, yeah. and sat down with the dean of the law school here, G. Kent Franson, just like we are right now. And I remember looking at him and saying, Mr. Franson, do you enjoy being a lawyer? Are you having fun? And he looked at me and he said, no, I'm not. And I said, really? I said, what would you do if you weren't? He said, I'd be in business. That's it. I already was gravitating in that Mm -hmm. direction that I really didn't want to go to law school and wasn't necessarily motivated, but given the family pedigree, you almost thought you had to, right? Right. That was enough for me. So I decided to stay in the lumber business and then became a precinct committeeman for the Republican Party. And we just bought a house right after we graduated. And the north side, Ron Glendale. And started there. That's where I started both politically and then in my business career right there. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. And so when you made that decision, though, you still had in the back of your mind that you wanted to run for office one day. Right, Right. sure did, sure did. Yeah, Yeah, you're you're always thinking, you want to be this, you want to be that, and what are the quote-unquote stepping stones to get there? And it's interesting how things, sorry to to digress here, but it's very interesting how things have changed and evolved, whereas... Back in that day when you had really strong political parties, both the Republicans and the Democrats, because remember back then, and I'm sure you've gone through some of your interviews, political parties actually, there was a patronage system. Mm-hmm. The Bureau Motor Vehicles actually funneled money to both the Republicans and the Democrats, right? And then you had to pledge 2% of your salary if you worked for state government, whether you're Republican or Democrat. So political parties were very strong, and there was very much a pecking order and a filtering system to work their way up. Today, they're a shell of what they were. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Now, did your awareness of politics change a bit when you were in college, or...? Not really. It was uh, the 1980s. That was the the rebirth of the Reagan, the conservative movement, if you will, in Mm -hmm. the United States. The country is either center-right or center-left in its particular aggregate ideology. And at that time, we had moved to center-right. We were just coming off Jimmy Carter and high inflation, right, Uh, lack of jobs, uh, oil prices, anything sound familiar, Uh, et cetera. So we were just coming off that, and and America, again, wanted a more conservative value, and that's Reagan did well. So he was very much a role figure, a role model for a lot Mm -hmm. of us. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And what was, like, the campus culture like then when you were in college politically? Yeah, so there was some political, there wasn't much, to be honest with you. I mean, think about this, about the most political overt thing that was going on in campus when I was there was during the Iranian hostage crisis. Oh, yeah. That was the only thing. Literally, there were marches, uh, but they were small. The fraternities would literally, in some of the dorms, would take bed sheets and unfurl them, supporting the hostages that were there. There was a little racial tension that was going on because you had some Iranian students that were there, primarily in the grad side, grad mm-hmm. student side, right? 
And so there was a little of that racial tension that was going on. Yeah. But for the most part, it was more of a nationalistic feel. That was the only politics. Keep in mind, this was at a time of very high interest rates, very high unemployment. So most of the people, I already had a job to go to, right? I had a family business, so I was very right. fortunate. But most of my fraternity brothers and my peer group at IU were all concerned about getting a job. And that's what their whole focus was. And that was just the guys, the girls, the same thing. And the hot places to go was Texas. Huh, and okay. the reason why most people matriculated down to Texas after they graduated, because that's where the jobs were, because the energy sector yeah. was so hot. That's why they went down to Texas. And then most of them, obviously, 10 years, 15 years, henceforth, came back. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um now, when did you get married? So, got we were married, my wife and I. She's from Erie, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. She was, a little sidebar story here, how we met, because that's important. Yeah. She was the president of the Student Athletic Board. So, we were both very active in campus activities, campus politics, if you want to call it, but sure. campus activities. So, at the president's house, when all the campus leaders would come. And the Student Athletic Board was the main organizing board to get student enthusiasm for athletics. Well, it was super easy to get people motivated for the IU basketball season, right? right. Super yeah. hard to get them motivated for the football season, yeah. Yeah. conversely. So we knew each other all four years, and um, just kind of a crazy story. I had been dating a girl for a couple of years, and that fell apart right uh, to at the end of my senior year or beginning of my senior year, and there's only two girls I want to take out. One was a girl from the same sorority that just dumped mm-hmm. me. They yeah. keep that in the record, right, for yeah. the record. <laughs> and then the other one was soon to be my wife, and I asked her out, and that was it. Yeah. Fell deeply in love, and so we were married a year later. Wow, 1983. Okay. Yeah, interesting. All right. Uh, do you have any children? I do. I have three children. And the oldest is Drew, who graduated, uh, obviously, high school in uh, Indianapolis and then went to Cathedral High School and then went to Miami of Ohio and the University of Idaho for a grad program. He was an athletic trainer hmm. at Miami of Ohio for the hockey team for about oh, wow. 11 years. Love that. Really enjoyed that. But college athletics is really changing, and it's, there's a real high burnout rate for that job. Yeah. So now he's in a medical, or medical product sales oh, okay. in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, doing very well. I have a daughter, Maggie, who went to Cathedral and then went to Butler University and then Michigan State Law School. So there's another Ruckel House in the legal field, yeah. right? <laughs> and she's in Washington, D.C. as we speak, working for Bloomberg. Oh, okay. And then my last child, uh, say least but not uh, the, the back but not the least, is Jay. Jay graduated from Cathedral and then went to Duke. I uh, got a full ride as part of the A.B. Duke Scholarship. Sadly, he uh, was injured between his senior year in high school and freshman year and mm. broke his neck and became a quadriplegic. Okay. Uh, spent a year at the Shepherd Center in Atlanta, Georgia, so I would go back and forth every week uh, to, to when my wife was down there to, to rehab to get back what he could. Didn't get back much, so he's still a quadriplegic, but mm-hmm. an amazing story because he was able to then go to Duke, graduate number one in his class. Wow won the uh, Truman, the Marshall, and the Rhodes Scholarship. Wow. So he's a Rhodes Scholar. He spent uh, two years in Oxford, England, and literally just last year finished up and got his Ph.D. at Oxford University. Wow. So, yeah, he's graduated, and he's home with us now in in a business startup. Wow. Okay. So saving a little bit of money, and uh, I guess we're investing in him now. (laughs) Yeah, I guess. (laughs) There you go. Yeah, that's how life works. Uh um, okay, so tell me a little bit about like uh, when you first decide you're going to run for the General Assembly. So I've had two stints of the General Assembly. Yes. So the first time was when I was kind of an interesting way to go, right? So the first time that I ran was in 1990. I'd been a Republican precinct committeeman. I was doing that stair-tepping, right? And again, these are very strong political parties, and you have to talk to everyone because back then the trick was you don't want to be too ambitious because then you get sent to the end of the line, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. So I started out as a precinct committeeman, really was a precinct committeeman until we just moved out of Marion County. And then I was Washington Township Advisory Board, sort of that local lowest level of government. Did that for one term. 
And then I ran for the Indiana House of Representatives in the slating. That's back when we had multi-member districts. Yeah. So the city was uh, the north side of Indianapolis, basically. 38th Street to Benford Boulevard to Michigan, uh, Michigan Avenue, all the way up to 465 was the district. There were three of us. And I defeated in the slating, because there were four of us running, I defeated Bill Spencer, who has since deceased. Good guy. Uh, but he was best friends with the party chairman. So that didn't really yeah. put me in great stead with the party chairman, right? right? right. So then I was elected and uh, served between 1990 and 1992, of which there was the redistricting year. And there was a lawsuit then that said that you had to break up the multi-member districts and that they need to be single-member, one man, one woman, one vote. Okay. And so we went to single-member districts the Democrats had control of the, of the House then, 52 to 48, uh, membership-wise. And literally, when they drew the districts, they went down my street and drew my house in with Paul Manweiler. <laughs> That's so, funny. Okay. And Paul was the minority leader right. at the time. Yeah. And Paul was a good friend, and I was sitting in his office, and I said, well, Paul looks like you're not running. Well, that was obviously a joke, because, yeah. no, I'm out. Yeah. So that's when I decided to run for the state Senate, in the spring of 1992, so I went through that process again of slating because that's when slating was everything, right? Sure. In the political party, both Republicans and Democrats did it in Marion County, Allen County, I think Lake County, and I won the slating big. Teresa Lubbers, uh, who was in the slating process, who I beat in the slating, decided to run against me in the primary, and that was the year of the woman in 1992. Mm -hmm. So every single primary in the state of Indiana where a male ran against a female, all the females won. Wow. Okay. But that's not the reason why I lost. I lost because, A, Teresa ran a better campaign than me, and frankly, she ended up being, and the timing was right, she was a much better state senator than I ever could have been at that time in my life. Yeah. So we became very good friends after that, and I'm a huge fan of uh, Teresa Lubber. She did a phenomenal job. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Now, you mentioned like redistricting playing a role in your political career. Um, how influential was were things like gerrymandering and stuff from you know, when you served the General Assembly? Yeah, well, back in those days, and I just mentioned and articulated, yeah. the Democrats did the quote-unquote gerrymandering to me. And keep in mind, gerrymandering is a very loose term because sure. who... When people say gerrymandering, not you, but man, right. but when people say gerrymandering, usually it's the minority, the ones that don't control the power. Right? Yes, that yeah. say that. That's yeah. usually who looks at it from that lens, yeah. right? So clearly, and that's why I sponsored the bill when I was in the Senate to go to a redistricting commission. Okay. And I strongly believe in that even to this day. I wasn't successful to get right. that done, but that's neither here nor there. But that is always omnipresent because regardless of state, regardless of party, the party in power, to be sure, doesn't want to give that up, right? You, right. St you start from that. But what's exasperated at fast forward, you didn't have as much then, and I'd be more than happy to break that down if you ask, but what's exasperated today is people of like ideology, frankly, are all compact in with each other. Mm -hmm. So, for example, more progressive or, or liberal Democrat-leaning folks clearly living in the urban mm -hmm. and really somewhat suburban areas. That's really the battleground in America. And then the exurbs, which would be like Noblesville, Cicero, uh, Westfield, et cetera, and then rural tend to be Republican. Right. And so people, it's very hard to draw these districts right now, yeah. right? Because if you if your goal is to have a competitive, all 100 competitive seats in the House, all 50 competitive seats in the Senate, mm -hmm. then you really do have to gerrymander. Because mm -hmm. you've got a Greg Porter, for example, who lives in literally an 80% Democrat district. You'd have to draw him all the way through Carmel mm -hmm. to make it competitive. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a tricky thing on right. like both both sides of the spectrum. Like, how do you how do you do that? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Now, when you were campaigning for the General Assembly, did you do uh, a lot of, like, door-to-door? -door oh, yeah. So yeah. How, how was that? So, a couple... Well, first of all, back when I was in the House, yeah. it was a very strong Republican district. So, if you won the slating, nobody filed against you in the primary from the Republican side, and then usually it was a 70-plus percent Republican district. So, it didn't ha It had less emphasis on the general election in, when I was in the House... 
in the early 90s. All of it was on the slating. So that was a function of there was maybe 110, 115 committee men that you really had to do one-on-ones with. And I'd sit in their homes or living rooms, yeah. et cetera, and have coffee with them, et cetera, et cetera. So that was important then. Fast forward, when I came back to the General Assembly in 2016, yes, it was a heavy emphasis on door-to-door. 15,000 doors okay. we knocked on. And they were that was us. Yeah. Uh, we had a small team. Uh, we never employed the big masses of people because people wanted to see you, the candidate. Yeah. And I, it's to me, door to door, there is no substitution. There's no greater, there is no more better time of your use of your time than that. Yeah, that's interesting. Did you have any kind of like funny experiences going door to door? Oh yeah. Well, first of all, let me tell you a funny story about uh, when I was in slating. Yeah. So you're, I was really focused on slating, and and to that point, nobody had ever gone to see one on one the the committeeman. Usually, they thought just send a mailer out or my service in the party yeah. was enough, whatever. But I went to see him all one on one individually, and nobody had ever done that. So I literally was in the middle of the care, two thirds of the way through the campaign, and I was sitting down to. A, you know, I knocked on the door, and the couple let me in. I'm sitting there, and they got the dog, and the baby, and the couple, and I'm just talking. I said, well, I'll see you Saturday for slating. And they look, Saturday, what are you talking about? I was at the wrong house. <laughs> oh <my laughs> so, so we had a great conversation, got their vote yeah. in the fall, but that didn't That's matter. That's funny. Okay. <laughs> so, yes, during the 2016 and then, of course, the 2020, there were a lot of great stories. So yeah. keep in mind... This the district that I represented yeah. was the old north side of Indianapolis. Okay, okay. so basically, with Butler Tarkington, the district was the southern part. Benford Boulevard was the east, up to 116th Street, over to to the Greek Orthodox Church, mm-hmm. and then all the way back down to Butler Tarkington. Very classic suburban district in America that was in a in a great straight of trans great state of transition. Mm-hmm. Roughly a third Democrat, a third Independent, and a third uh, Republican. And the Independents were the most important part of the district. If yeah. you won the Independents, you would win the district if you kept your base. Yeah. It was as simple and as complex as that. So we really focused on the Independents. And it was a district, Trump's first reelect, that yeah. didn't necessarily like him. Yeah. And then in 2020, really didn't like him, right? Yeah. So a lot of times you would get this, what party are you? You'd get the question, right? What sure. political party? Because Trump had kind of faded. Yeah. And I, I got kind of tired of that. And I always look at him and say, I'm a member of any party you invite me to. <laughs> and they'd laugh like you just did right there, right. Ben. And nine times out of ten, yeah. we'd have a really good conversation. Yeah. And then we'd be okay. Then I had one conversation that always will stick with me probably the rest of my life. I was... Uh, talking to a lady, and it was on a Friday afternoon, and mm-hmm. it was over in the Arden uh, neighborhood area, which is over, I think, about 71st and College area. Okay. And she came out, and she was in tears, and arms were flailing, and it was all about Trump, and she couldn't sleep, and he had ruined her life, and mm-hmm. things were just awful, and, and how could blah, blah, blah. And I listened to her, and, and, mm-hmm. and really, I, I understand and I looked at her, and I had a piece of my campaign literature with my son on it in a wheelchair, and I mentioned that earlier. Yeah. And I said, ma'am, I get it. I understand. I know how you feel, and I'm sorry you feel that way. But I have a quadriplegic son, uh-huh. and nobody and nothing's going to ever get me down. No one individual is ever going to get me down. Yeah. We're going to plow through this, and we're going to be stronger and better because of that. And she looked at me and gave me a huge hug, and that was it. Yeah. And it just is that... What, what I think I'm getting at in that story is politics is emotion. Yes, yeah. At its core, it's emotion. And you have to understand that, right? Yeah. So those are some of the fun stories and yeah. heartwarming stories, I think. Do you think that uh, a lot of your colleagues also do door-to-door? Is that pretty much a standard thing? or Most are. Now, when I say that, in the competitive districts, yes. Yeah. In the uncompetitive districts... Uh, and there's the majority of members of the General Assembly, both parties. You know, I mentioned Representative Porter, for example, in the urban area. I doubt he's had to do any door to door, just going to a few functions, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And conversely, uh, Jeff Thompson comes to mind, right? And probably an 80% rural, semi rural Republican district. I doubt he's gone any door to door. And that's no indictment against either of those two. They're great individuals, great legislators. It just depends on the district. Sure. So in these suburban hyper districts, yes, 
if you are in a primary, right, in those uh, in those districts, maybe you might have to, yeah, right, because when you get into super majorities or very strong districts, sometimes you can tend to get primaried for the Republicans from the right and for the Democrats from the left. AOC is a good example of that in New York City. Sure, yeah. Right? She came from the left from a person in leadership in the U.S. House, who, who'd been a Democrat, who'd been there a long time. Right, yeah. It's true. Yeah. Right. And districts matter. Districts yeah. matter. Um, now, what did you campaign on when you first ran? So when I first ran, and keep in mind, this I had a unique perspective because I'd been in the General Assembly yep. before, and I'm the second longest post person coming back, 24 years. Yeah. So it had been 24 years since I had been back. I think there's one other person, Ed Feigenbaum, had did, did the research and said I was the second longest. Mm-hmm. So things had obviously changed a lot then. And so what I really focused on was the spirit of bipartisanship. Okay. Even though Indiana and legislatures around the country act better and behave better than their peer group in Washington, right? There's this general sense that there's extremes, there's polarization. So I really campaigned on, and it really was something that resonated within the district. So my campaign theme, both in 2016 and 2020 and forever henceforth, will be a voice of reason. Mm -hmm. And that's what we wanted to be. That's what we were when we served is a voice of reason, someone that can bring people together. Uh, and, and frankly, the toughest part is bringing factions with your own party together. Yeah. Right? That's even more difficult than bringing Republicans and Democrats together. Sure. So uh, that that's what we focused on, bipartisanship, a voice of reason. Yeah. Now, when you served, did you feel like you were able to, you know, bring that to life in the General Assembly? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think what helped me was... The fact that I had the experience before, I knew some of the representatives and senators going in. I had served, we didn't talk about this, I had served in the Daniels administration from, we'd sold the lumber business, and a quick story about that, I remember going to see Governor Daniels, who's a good friend of our family, and this is in the, right now, September of 2006, (laughs) and we'd sold the lumber business, and I said, Governor Daniels, I'm, I'm ready to come back to state government, I'm ready to come back to public service. He said, great, we'd love to have you. He said, what are you doing? And this is in the governor's office. I said, well, actually, I'm unemployed. He said, perfect. He said, go down the hall and help run or oh, next door here and help run the Department of Workforce Development. They run the unemployment section, and you're qualified. <laughs> True story. Oh, my God. So I did that, Sam, for two and a half years, traveled the state, went to all 92 counties. So a lot of those legislators, I had already been to see them in their districts and had worked on unemployment and economic development issues with them in their districts. I already had kind of that basis of a relationship with them, credibility, if you will. And so that helped out a great deal. Yeah. And I was able to come in and then help leverage that, right? Because actually they looked at me when I came in. It's amazing. Most members of the General Assembly, because they truly have come from the outside world, they don't have a clue how state government works. Mm -hmm. They really don't understand all the different agencies, how they interact, and then more importantly, how the governor's office interacts with all those agencies. So I was able to kind of cut through that form, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's cool. Sounds like you probably got to have a lot of interesting experiences then yeah. traveling around the whole state. And... I did. That was a lot of fun. I saw I saw a lot of things, if you don't mind me digressing here no, for a sec, it. because if you think about it, what I saw between two so I started out with unemployment with in the Daniels administration at four percent. When I left, it was ten yeah. percent. Mitch will tell you to this day that was my fault, by the way. <laughs> but and he's probably right. But what I saw firsthand was the true uh, uh, mitigation, not mitigation, but, but transformation of the Indiana economy. We are still heavy manufacturing, even still to this day, but manufacturing is topping out. So I saw and was active when Guide, Borg Warner, Visteon, Whirlpool down at Evansville, all these major, major plants were shutting down, right? That was a great recession. They were shutting down for that reason, and they were offshoring. So I saw firsthand all these thousands of workers that were being displaced 
less education, where were they going to go? And so our job was to try to retrain them, right, yeah. through some programs we had through the Department of Labor or help steer them into a position for the jobs of the future. And there wasn't many jobs. I mean, call center jobs were premium jobs back then mm-hmm. at $10 an hour, yeah. if you think about it. So I was able to see what I believe was the beginning of the opioid crisis because the opioid crisis had its origins in these economic transformations when you took a major employer out, Scott County, for example, you took major employer out and you had third, second, third, fourth, fifth generation of family that worked there. And that's all they knew. Yeah. And they were resilient to change, very resilient to change. And I'm not saying change is easy. It's not. Sure. Yeah. So they, they were desperate. And so they fell into this trap. So I saw that. And then I saw this great, right before my eyes, if you think about it, kind of this transformation of a lot of political realignment. A lot of those, especially Southern Indiana, who were all Democrats when I started the Indiana House of Representatives, who fell into this and then transformed over to, quote, unquote, this Trump Republicans, if you will. Mm, yeah. Right. And then so fast forward in 2016 and 2020, that was the nucleus and the foundation of that. So it was a fascinating time that I had a front row seat to all this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, when you served in the 90s, uh, before actually you served, what was your reaction to winning the election in the General Assembly? Oh, it was great. In the 90s, it was great. I mean, I was young. Uh, It's euphoria. It's you think the sky's the limit. Uh, at that point, you, you danced around. As a matter of fact, I even had someone, there were some groups that didn't like Dan Burton, who was a current congressman, and okay. they came to me and yeah. said, hey, we want you to run for Congress. And I said, you want what? <laughs> well, I figured out pretty quickly that they didn't really want me. They wanted Dan Burton out. And yeah, that's, you yeah. know, I'm not going to necessarily get involved in that. It, right. And that's one of the things you have to understand in politics early on when groups come to you. Are they coming to you for you or right. for something else? Sure. Nine times out of ten, it's something else, right? <laughs> you got to figure it out. Yeah. So it was euphoria. It was awesome. It was the building was larger than it is now. Uh, the whole process, the, the General Assembly, the State House, the whole legislative process, it's literally like a drug. It's intoxicating. Because you get in and you're engrossed in the issues, you're engrossed in helping your constituents, that's all you're thinking about. It's hard to remember you've got a family and you've got a business. Mm -hmm. So you've got to balance the two, even though we're part-time. Yeah. Quote, unquote, right? Sure. So that was probably one of the, after the euphoria had worn off quickly, that you had to realize balancing family. And I had young children, very young children at that point. Yeah, yeah, that can always be challenging for right. sure. Right. Um, now, I guess there wasn't, was there a big transition for you when you were serving the General Assembly? I guess you'd been around kind of politics mm-hmm. your whole life, so you kind of probably knew what to expect, I suppose. I did. Uh, the big transition probably was how to, I'm used to dealing in the lumber business, right, with customers. So customer service and salesmanship. And this was really the same thing, right? All those skill sets were the same to the extent of salesmanship. You're selling yourself, you're selling ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Customer relations, you're taking care of your constituents. And I always had an axiom in the lumber business that the best time to get a customer is when that customer is upset. And how you took care of that customer. Right. So I took all that skill set and all that knowledge to the same thing with the constituents. <laughs> and in 2016 and 2020, I had a lot of a lot of opportunity when they were upset, right? <laughs> That's true. I had a lot of opportunity to do that. But uh, also what I transitioned to in the 20, what I did a little bit in 20, in 1991 and 1992, I would have town halls. And we would ha- in the meadows, all African-American. And so my other contemporaries didn't show, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. So I would go and have town halls in the, in the meadows. It was all African-American constituents then. I love that. I learned a lot at mm-hmm. that point. School choice, that's when I filed the first voucher bill in the state of Indiana, which, yeah. which went in the shredder real fast, right, when the Democrats had the majority. Sure. But it was interesting to have those conversations in the very impoverished area of the city 
about when those parents were trapped with failing schools at that point, and the parents were clamoring for anything because they knew the only ticket out of poverty was education, consistent mm -hmm. ticket. Sure, the uh, child may have a shot at the NFL or the NBA or something, but consistently education was the only shot out of poverty. Yeah. And then fast forward in 2016 when I won, uh, Representative, I, I sat down with Representative Kerry Hamilton right after the election, and I said, let's do bipartisan town halls. And so she said, yeah, let's do it, and to her credit. So we started out, I don't know if you know about this, but we started out with about 50 people in our first town hall, and then we grew to about 75, and then Representative Delaney joined. So there were three of us, and we did them at St. Luke's United Methodist Church. We were averaging almost 300 people hmm. at our bipartisan town halls, the only ones in the state, only ones in the state. And we would tackle all the tough issues uh, anything was on the table, and we'd talk about. So yeah. they were they were great to work with. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, uh, now think about school choice. So, what mm -hmm. was the debate about school cho choice when you served? So, in uh, two two different periods, obviously, yes, which are yeah. very interesting. So, clearly, in 90, 90, 90 through ninety two, it was a new concept. Teachers unions were very strong in the state of Indiana as a political entity and as a uh, lobbying entity, et cetera. So clearly they didn't want that. They felt that was a threat, correct? So when I introduced it, the, mil the only successful and uh, operable models in the United States were the Milwaukee school system. That was the bill that mm -hmm. I offered, which was a replicate, replica of that, or Washington, D.C., those are the only two models that were applicable in the United States that were ongoing for vouchers and school yeah. choice. So there was really education. Like, what is this? You mean I, I, I'm moving to Pike Township because I want to go to Pike Township, or I'm moving to Center or uh, Washington Township because I want my kids to go to Washington Township, right? This whole concept of no money follows a child was still very foreign. That was not on the table. It was all about state money, went to all these different schools, mm -hmm. and that was the fight. Yeah. So fast forward, when I came back in 2016, some of the other bigger fights had already started. Keep in mind, the voucher system in the state of Indiana was allowed and was voted on by Pat Bauer, mm -hmm. Speaker of the House, Democrat out of South Bend. And I give Pat all the credit. Pat's a great man. I, I thoroughly have the utmost respect for Speaker Bauer. Good stalwart of unions, obviously the teachers' unions he was very strong in, but Pat knew that competition, and especially those that were impoverished, mm -hmm. that was the only ticket out. So he literally let the voucher system begin right yeah. with, the, with the choice scholarships, and that was back in 2009, I believe, session. So then it grew from there. So it had already been baked in a little bit, right? But it's still very contentious, Right, mm -hmm. still extremely contentious, and when you looked at it, and this, these are the conversations that I would have, especially at our town halls, because Washington Township schools, a lot of the uh, they were very, they were very political, and they were very adamant about no public dollars should go outside of the public sphere, right? Especially to Catholic schools, religious schools. Well, all those fights had happened, and yeah. the Supreme Court had already ruled that that was permissible, so that. Horses had left, right? But they were still very, you know, hanging on to that. And parents wanted that. You know, middle class, independent families, they, they wanted that choice. Now, that didn't mean they always did it, mm -hmm. right? Americans love choice, but they usually fall back to what they're most comfortable with, right, right at the end of the day. Yeah. And I kept pointing out, look, this is not the draconian situation that you're all making it out to believe because over 94 95% of school children in the state of Indiana still pick their traditional schools mm -hmm. right and the largest choice that's going on in movement are students and parents moving from one public school to another public school which could be people that want to, that live in Lawrence Township want to go to Washington Township right yeah. so long as they had choice or had had the openings in those schools so that resonated with parents to get parents more of a say in what they're doing and their tax dollars. Mm -hmm. So that was much different because the concept had been baked in, right? It had been explored. Yeah. Now we're down to what kind of expansion levels of it. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and so how would like the 
with the school choice concept and stuff, how did like the, the busing system for, for kids, how that work is if, if a kid's parents, you know, they, if they ride the bus to a school, do they yeah. go to a different bus system or how that work? Well, it's still, I mean, it's interesting you bring up busing because yeah. when I was serving in the early 90s, yeah, yeah. That, that's still the segregation issue. When yeah. you say busing, right. we were just coming off the heels and the bruises and the battles of that. Sure. Yeah. So even though that was settling down, right, so then you get back, really the transportation wasn't much of an issue, mm-hmm. right, because people are, it's a much more mobile society. Yeah. A lot of parents just decided to do their own, right, transportation if, if they're going to make that kind of a choice. Sure. Or... Uh, the uh, the public transportation. I think the only literally little debate that we got into is I believe the public transportation d- is responsible for taking some kids to the Catholic schools. Yeah. Right. And so there was a little bit of that, but nobody really pushed too hard on that. Sure. It was right. it was it was de minimis. Yeah. Uh, do you remember the first bill that you'd sponsored or authored when you served? Oh, in the so clearly yes. In the House of Representatives when I was there, it yeah. was the school voucher okay. bill. Yep. And then the second bill that I introduced was the privatization of prisons so to oh. allow private operators to come in, right? And uh, it didn't pass then, but eventually it did pass. And then obviously the voucher did pass. So those were in the House, uh, the areas that I was focusing on. And in the Senate, I worked very hard on sort of that going back to that workforce space and trying to find, again, we talked about before the redistricting commission. I worked on that. I also had a, um, I was very sensitive about the environment in our district, and I had a, uh, a public forest uh, bill that was going to be sort of a 100 year long term plan for our public forests. Uh, one of the things that I'm very keen about is we only look at state government into the future, the next two years for the next budget. Right. And that's about all we can see. And there are so many things that are coming at us and changing and demographics and artificial intelligence and so many things that are really a threat slash an opportunity to Indiana. I want to look 25, 30 years out. What, mm-hmm. what are the major s- obstacles slash opportunities for the state of Indiana? Yeah. So one of the things that I really focused on was a piece of legislation that I filed. I passed the Senate. Uh, passed uh, passed the house and then the uh, got tucked away in the governor's office. But it was the real world career readiness. And what I found when I was traveling, the origins of that is when I was traveling the state, and I saw literally in front of me the education that we have, and it's a very siloed system, and that try to connect the education to the workforce of today and tomorrow, and you can't have silos. So it basically was the integration of the community college system, Ivy Tech slash Vincennes, into the high schools. So every single high school had Vincennes and or Ivy Tech in there. And it was all seamless. So if you want to stay one extra year, you could graduate at at, at the end of your 13th year with a high school diploma, an industry-recognized certificate, an associate's degree, zero debt, and a job. Yeah. And I firmly believe that to this day. As a matter of fact, I would take it even to the next level because I think this is what Indiana desperately needs because you need businesses to be integrated into that as well. Mm-hmm. So that I passed, and what, what killed it at the end is the educational industrial complex that I call it, right? Yeah. They felt like they were going to get shortchanged. And I always joke, Ivy Tech thinks they've got a better football team than IU, right? Some years they do, yeah. but the point of that is, is that it's got to be it's got to be seamless. So I worked on that. Another bill that I had uh, passed the Senate, it got stalled in the House, was the Indiana Service Program. I don't know if you heard about that, Ben? No, I don't think so. So the Indiana Service Program basically was going to target. We we're going to start out as a pilot, and it was going to target a very diverse group, both geographically and socioeconomically, as well as racially. And it was going to target that summer period uh, students that were rising between their junior and senior year in high school. And they were going to be housed at a university. And it was going to be a small 100, 200, just something that was manageable so we could try it for a couple, two or three years and see how it would work. Right. Right. So for the first couple, two or three days, they were going to work on an Indiana farm together. Wow. Next couple, two or three days, you're going to work in a manufacturing environment. Next couple, two or three days, you're going to work on the White River doing some service projects, et cetera. 
the whole point was during that period to take them all the way around and expose them, be a teacher, right? Work with a teacher. Expose them to all Indiana-centric jobs so that they could get massive exposure. Hey, I had no idea manufacturing was so cool. Yeah. It's like playing video games, right? Mm-hmm. I thought there was something sweaty and I can make that kind of money and have zero debt. Sign me up. Right. Or, gosh, I'd love to be a teacher, and I hope they do. Let's be a teacher. So it was to do that, and again, they're not having their cell phones. They're going to learn interpersonal skills. They're going to learn those soft skills, right? They're going to be working together side by side. And what better way to get started than somebody up from Gary working next door to a kid from Carmel whose dad probably owns three businesses, yep. and they're sweating on an Indiana farm, and they got to work together. Yeah, true. Yeah, it seems like an interesting idea to yeah. expose uh, the youth to all the potential options for their future. Right. And, yeah. Right, exactly. So I passed that out of the Senate and then um, couldn't get a hearing in the House. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bummer. Um, so how often would you say when you served both times were you working across the aisle uh, and successfully able to get people on board together uh, to pass legislation all the time, all the time. That was that was really what I was doing. That was my goal, yeah. and that was my that was my. And a good example of that is the bias crimes bill. So the bias crimes bill that Senator Sue Glick uh, had started before I got there, she had actually passed the Senate, and then it died over in the House. And then I picked up the ball with Sue. We co-sponsored it together. Uh, all three or four years of my uh, legislative, actually three years, because it passed uh, in twenty nineteen. Uh, Sue and I stepped back to let another author carry it over. Sometimes you have to do that, right? Sometimes you have to get some new blood in there to get it done. But Sue and I were working very hard behind the scenes. So that was a a bill that really, if anything, I was negotiating more with my own party than I was with the Democrats, right? Now, the Democrats clearly, in good faith, wanted to take it a little bit farther. But like all good legislation, we met in the middle. Right. But that's a good example of that. Yeah, okay. Um, and were the interactions between Republicans and Democrats pretty good from what you witnessed? They were. They were. Now, keep in mind that that was a 40-10 split, right? 40 uh, Republicans and yeah. 10 Democrats. And so they were always felt a little hurt that they didn't have more of a leadership role. And I always was very cognizant to the best of my ability that when we would go to forums together and we mm-hmm. would be in any public environment to let them take the lead. Mm-hmm. Right when they were discussing it and and, and things like that, because I knew how sensitive that was in certain communities. Yeah. And I think you get more done in a body politic when you don't care and you don't have the pride of authorship. Mm-hmm. And if you're okay with letting somebody else take all the glory or whatever, you know, I I, I got I had all that stuff. Be I'm an IU football fan and a Chicago Cubs fan. I've had all yeah. that, that stuff been beaten out of me for years. Sure. Right. But you actually can do more things behind the scenes and if you are willing and comfortable with letting somebody else take the lead and even take the glory. Yeah. Who cares who gets it done? Right. Right? Sure. Now, um, when you first served, it sounded like the Democrat and Republican numbers were closer. Um, why do you think that change happened where you have, you know, a fairly even split to a supermajority? Southern Indiana, big time. Yeah. And so here's what happened. So if you think about it, with this, when I served in ni- between 1990 and 1992, mm-hmm. everything south of 70 or 40, right out the street here, right, uh, were only three Republicans all the way down to the river. Fast forward to 2010, that election, it completely flipped. So now there's, what, three, maybe four max Democrats Uh, Southern, because Indiana, to understand Indiana politics, you really have to go all the way back. Our culture, our ideology lines up, at least in Southern Indiana, Central Indiana, Northeastern Indiana, not so much Northwestern Indiana, because that's so much of the Chicago market, right? Mm -hmm. But the rest of the state lines up with the South. Ideologically, politically, culturally, we line up more with Kentucky, Tennessee, and even Alabama, than we do Illinois for sure, right? Or even Michigan, Minnesota, anything else in the Midwest. So you could see where that made a lot of sense, that even though they were Democrats, 
They were conservative Democrats. They were socially conservative Democrats. The vast majority of Democrats in southern Indiana when I served were all pro-life. Mm-hmm. The abortion issue has always been around us. It's been omnipresent. Yeah. But they all voted pro-life, and they were Democrat. Yeah. So when this evolution and this realignment was coming in southern Indiana, that tipped the scale, and it went fast. So now you're all the way down to the county commissioners are all Republicans in southern Indiana. So therein lies the reason why we're in the supermajorities right now. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, you mentioned the abortion debate. How did the abortion debate change from when you first served to when you were, you know, your last session? Yeah, so the abortion debate, again, was omnipresent uh, mm-hmm. there. At the Supreme Court, right, Roe versus Wade was the law of the land. So yep. leadership, and it, your listeners all will understand this, that even though you're elected member of the Indiana General <laughs> Assembly, unless you're in leadership, you're yeah. an extra on the cast of Ben-Hur, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so leadership, obviously, because of Roe versus Wade yeah. and that check and balance, never let the issue really get past around the edges, right? Sure. You, you would have bills that would come up about uh, 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 informing, informed consent, parental notification, all those kinds of things, which I call are around the edges, right? And then obviously it burst on the scene uh, with the Dobbs decision, mm-hmm. and it's up to the states. So you had all this pent-up demand that poof, yeah. came crashing through. So you're going to see around the United States, again, back to that culture and how we align up with the South. So you'll see the South and you'll see some of the Western states, right, and some of the very Northern tier states be pretty strong on the Mm -hmm. pro-life position. And then, of course, the coasts and the more liberal states. And then maybe some of the states that are now more marginal and in play, which could be Georgia because the explosion of the Atlanta suburbs, right? Yeah. That may be kind of an outlier there. But that's how the abortion issue is going to play out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now, did you ever go against party leadership? Oh, yeah. Oh, very yeah. much so. Well, just to get the job to begin with, yeah, yeah. right, in the uh, sure. in the house, I ran against the party's best yeah. friend and right. business partner. I forgot to mention that. He was his business partner, too. <laughs> Which probably looking back on it wasn't the wisest move, but kind of target on your back. Right yes. Away. So Ruckelhouses have a history of being mavericks. So my father ran against the slate two times to become a state senator and was elected overwhelmingly in the mm-hmm. uh, by the people uh, against the slate, if you will. Yeah. My uncle stood up to Richard Nixon yeah. in the Saturday Night Massacre. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I stood up to the party chairman, and I was very independent in my votes. Uh, and a good example of that was the net metering bill. That was one of the first bills that I had in the Senate. Uh, that was a bill that leadership was really trying to push at that time. And my district didn't like it, and I believe in competition, so I voted against that. Hmm. Okay. And, uh, it, well, at the risk of not being able to advance in some things. Yeah, sure. Uh, what were the differences between the House and Senate from your perspective? Oh, they were gargantuan. Yeah. Uh, so the House, let's go in the reverse order. So the House, obviously 100 members, you're elected every two years. The whole concept behind that is, and the Founding Fathers concept is, they're the ones, the budget starts there, they're the ones that handle the money, mm-hmm. so they want them closer to the people. That's the whole origin of that. And the Senate, they want as a more thinking body, right? Well, yeah. people will challenge me on my thinking process, but that's okay. <laughs> so the House is much more political. So you are used to a lot more strategy games, second reading amendments, right? A lot more challenges of the chair. The chair is always fair. Sp- uh, Speaker Phillips would always say the chair is always fair. Yeah. Uh, great man, by the way. And so uh, you, it was very political. So at the beginning all the way to the end of the House, it's a much more political environment. It's also more fun. It's a little looser. Uh, you, you, you tend to be more camaraderie because you're under a lot more stress, you're under a lot more pressure, right? So the house is that. The Senate is a little more collegial to the extent that you have four years Mm -hmm. from which to work. You rarely have challenges to the president of the Senate, right? Uh, which is, uh, the Lieutenant governor. You rarely have challenges to that. Sure, it's becoming a little more 
uh, is the Democrats or the opposition part of the minority party, and I don't blame them, but as the minority party, obviously, is trying to flex their muscle a little bit, and as more of the state issues are coming down to the state levels, like abortion, for yeah. example, uh, you, it's becoming more second reading uh, amendment uh, heavy now, where Democrats or the opposition party is trying to get people on the record because, or trying to get their point across on the second reading. What most people don't realize until you get out, yes, if you're doing that to get a political point across and to get stuff for a direct mail piece in the next campaign, sure. But you walk out of that building, nobody pays attention to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nobody does. <laughs> um, let's see, how influential would you say lobbyists were when you served? About the same as they are right now, yeah. honestly. I don't think that has changed hardly at all because clearly what they do and what they bring to the table is subject matter experts, right. expertise in, in certain areas and, and conduits of information. Mm -hmm. And especially, as I mentioned, they know state government and how to navigate state government. Very few of the individual members have any exposure at all to state government. Yeah. It's not an indictment. It's just they've been busy as sure. farmers, lawyers, or teachers or right. whatever. Yeah. So that hasn't changed hardly at all. Yeah. Uh, do you think when you served, do you think like campaign donations or gifts from lobbyists, do you think that affected how people would vote? or? Uh, not really because mm -hmm. maybe maybe a little bit more back then, but mm -hmm. the campaigns now are horribly expensive. Yeah. And really it's the rise of these outside groups, right, that have come in because most of the the lobbyists and the local money is capped. There's there's only so much that they had to bring to the table, right? Mm -hmm. So you really don't have that as much. Right now, it's more of the caucuses. So the caucuses are probably have grown in stature as the political parties have weakened, okay? Here's what I mean by that. Is, and it doesn't matter whether you're in the majority or the minority yeah. in either chamber. Your job as speaker, as minority leader, as minority Senate uh, president and president of the Senate, is to go out and raise money for your caucus. Right, right. And then your caucus decides which districts to get behind in a re-election. So you are one of the main engines of financial acumen, right, yeah. to that candidate depending upon who it is. So it's not discriminatory to majority or minority or Republicans or Democrats. They both do it. It's just the way it works. Yeah. So it's very interesting phenomena. As political parties have declined, caucuses have risen. Yeah, that's power. interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. Fill the void. Yep, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, now, based on all your experiences, what would you change about the legislative process? You know... I, if I had a magic wand, maybe that's the, the question, sure. right? If I had a magic wand, Ben, I, I would like to see as a part of redistricting the net result to have more competitive districts. Mm -hmm. I do think that it's better to have more competitive districts. You're still going to have a majority of one part. It's just because of where people live, right? right? Course, that, yeah. Unless you're going to... Unless you're going to contract with Mayflower and start moving people around, yeah. right? It's just not going to happen. So I think that is one thing because you do look at things differently when you're in a competitive district than when you're in a heavy Democrat or a heavy Republican district. And you are, just by sheer human nature, more likely to compromise than if you're in a heavy Democrat or heavy Republican. Right now, Republicans, obviously, because we have the supermajority, catch all the flack, right? Because you mm -hmm. don't compromise, you don't do this. I could take every one of the Democrats and these strong Democrats, same thing. Mm -hmm. The exact same thing, all over the country. Yeah. So it's not just Indiana. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I think it's that. I think, number one, I think, number two, I would invest in LSA. I think that the legislature is very frugal and wise, of course, to be frugal for the taxpayers. That's always a good thing. But it's kind of a misnomer to even say that we're a part-time legislature anymore because the demands and the shift from the federal government down to the state government, right, mm -hmm. is becoming more and more omnipresent and people are demanding that because you can get more done, right? And that's a good thing. But the tools that legislators need, 
uh, are becoming stronger. So, for example, and again, frugality is good. I work for Mitch Daniels. I get it. And I'm cheap, too. Yeah. But but the point is, when you've got one legislative assistant sharing with four state reps, right, and one with two or three for state senators, and then conversely with LSA, I would like to see invest in a research arm with LSA or contract out with yeah. some entity so that I could, let's say, for these big picture issues that I would really like to study more, right, and have more in-depth analysis. Because LSA is just hats off. Mm-hmm. They work Herculean, but they're only human and they can only do so much. Yeah. So to invest in LSA, right, uh, the caucuses, uh, and, and trying to do that. And then the last thing I think that we ought to, I've been thinking a lot about, is something to consider, again, back to this more competitive districts and what we're seeing in American politics today, more of the fringes because of these districts, is ranked choice voting. I don't know if you're familiar yeah, with that, ben, yeah. or seen that. Yeah, I know it's been promoted uh, a fair amount recently. Yeah. Right, right. And, and I think I would like to do a deeper dive into that mm-hmm. because I think that you might have a better net result, right? A, you could get more people to run and participate, yep. good thing. But B, the net outcome tends to be uh, a more solid choice, right? Right Versus potential. Yeah. A uh, less extreme candidate coming yeah. to play. Right, either side, either yep. side. So those would be the, the magic wand things that I'd look at. Mm-hmm. How close do you think Indiana is to implementing any of those? Um, I would say not tomorrow for sure. <laughs> right. Right. Um, you know, we still have to wait, obviously, another nine years or whatever from a redistricting standpoint. <laughs> right. So that'll have to play itself out. Uh, the rank choice, I don't know. Senator Walker and I, who was then chair of elections, looked at this very hard, and he was... He was becoming amenable to it. Another thing, too, we, we didn't talk about is straight ticket voting. Mm-hmm. Is also elimination of straight ticket voting. Indiana is one of nine states that still allows straight ticket voting. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you could still go in if you eliminate it. Because what straight ticket voting is now with the machines, right. literally just... It's like Democrat or Republican, and it just goes to the whole Correct. Ballot. Yeah. Correct. And that plays to what... Because I was a co-sponsor of the, uh, what do you call it, not the ethics in, uh, in government, but sort of the uh, civics, yeah. civics. We need to be more engaged, right? And it's yeah. shocking what's coming out of our schools today, right, that they have very little knowledge of civics. And it behooves people to get more active and, mm-hmm. and engaged in that. So, yeah, I would love to see that. You can still go in and vote for every Democrat, every Republican, every Independent, yeah. no problem. But you've got to look at every single office. Yeah, okay. Um, what would you say were the most controversial legislative issues when you served? Well, in the first term, um, in, in, in the House, oh, you'll love this, and one of the most controversial in 91, obviously redistricting the budget, but uh, local measured service. Okay. What is that, right? Yeah. So that's back when landlines, there was no cell phones. Okay. Maybe that was at the infancy of it, but yeah. landlines. And the telephone company was saying, hey, we can in parentheses, make more money. But instead of unlimited calls, right, for X dollars per month, let's charge you per call. So the argument was, hey, if you don't make many calls, you're not gonna, your telephone bill is going to go down. <laughs> well, seniors hated that, yeah. right? Because seniors, that was their lifeblood to talk to grandkids and everything yeah. else. So that blew up. That was really controversial. Right. Uh, there was also uh, end of the life issues that were going on, withholding of uh, hydration, nutrition and hydration, end of life decisions. That probably was sort of a subset of the abortion issue for social conservatives, right? Mm-hmm. So that was going on. Uh, Evan Bay was governor. And the creation of FSSA was very controversial, which was a combination of multiple state agencies to create Families and Social Services Administration. Yeah. So that was very controversial, right, back in the day. <laughs> uh, labor wars, we had a lot of labor wars back then. I started the Labor Committee, and basically what happened then is what, because organized labor was very strong, right, in the private sector. Not so much about the public sector. Teachers union, yes, but today you've got the explosion of the public sector, and the private sector unions are way down. 
So manufacturing, that's who we are, was heavily unionized. So if they couldn't get it at the bargaining table, they would always come to the legislature and try to get it. Sure. And there were big fights over that. So fast forward to when I served, obviously education, the vouchers, soon to be teacher pay, right? This whole concept about that, the budget. Um, solar panels, which is that net metering, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and then obviously in the last couple of years has been more the explosion of the social conservative issues, which is abortion, transgender, obviously prior to that, the same sex marriage, yep. right, was a big deal. So this whole social conservative uh, movement that's been going on, and I'll argue that we've been able to have that because the economic issues haven't been superseding that. Mm-hmm. When you get into recessions, those issues take a back seat. Right. Yeah. True. Um, so how would you summarize your time then overall uh, as in the General Assembly? Phenomenal. I miss yeah. every bit of it. I still miss it to this day. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And why did you leave the General Assembly then uh, the last time? Well... Uh, You might want to ask about 2,395 voters who didn't vote for me. (laughs) In other words, I lost, right? Uh, Yeah, we ran uh, ran for re-election in 2020 in a district that had tipped into Democrat. Uh, And so it was, whereas it was a 50-50 district in 2016 when I ran, when we started running for re-election in 2020, it was a Democrat plus nine. So we fought all the way back in the reelect uh, to only lose about by 3.9 or 3.8 points. So we got pretty close, and uh, we gave it our all, but that's the reason why. Yeah. Would you ever like, consider trying to run again at some point? Well, we'll see. Uh, you know, we, the, the big thing is that redistricting, so the district we moved, and the district that I served in, I don't live in that district now, oh, okay. and that's been redistricted now to all of Marion County. And that's a very solid Democrat district now, yeah. so no. Okay. That option doesn't exist. I live in Senator J.D. Ford's district now. I looked at it hard about running in that district, but decided with factors of my life, and I have a 92-year-old mm-hmm. mother, and I, I just need to be home right now. Sure. So, so. Um, public service is still something that we'll just see. Yeah. Well, thinking the big picture, um, what lessons did you learn from your experiences serving? The biggest lesson is what I was most comfortable with is the ability to help others, right? Uh, The ability to to always keep your eye on the big picture. Mm -hmm. It's really easy, especially in that world, to just throw yourself in into the cause du jour or the cause of the moment or the crisis of the moment, right? It's really easy to do that. It's much harder to take the long view and, you know, a school shooting, for example, on both sides could take their positions real super simple and real super fast. It's much harder to say, hey, let's wait a minute, let's get the facts together, Let's visit with those families that sadly have lost someone, right, Mm -hmm. and listen to them and talk to them. Let's talk to the advocates on both sides because everybody runs to their camps as soon as one of those sadly occurrences happen, right? And then let's take the long view of that. What's really the the right thing from the long-term view? And Indiana does a really good job of that. We've been very blessed with the leadership that we've had, Mm -hmm. Republican and Democrat, in both periods that I served that have done a really good job of being adults in the room. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And Indiana does a good job of that. Um, did you have any regrets as a legislator? No. <laughs> no, I really didn't. Yeah. I, I, well, I take that back. I, there is one bill that I, to this day, I don't feel comfortable, and that was the gaming bill, the last gaming bill that went through. And I have uh, never been one. I, historically, in the House, I voted against all the gaming bills when I was in the House. Mm-hmm. And in the Senate, we didn't have many gaming bills because the industry had matured. But we did have one that came up, I think, in 2018 or 2019. And that was one that allowed sports betting. Yeah. And that's probably the one bill that I look back and I wish I had that vote back. Primarily because, not that I'm opposed to gaming, and we're already pregnant, right? We're already into yeah. this. But I worry about um, the gaming world, the sports world, now that, and I didn't know what was coming at that time, right, which Mm -hmm. was all the NIL and paying players. 
this is semi-pro in college right now, mm-hmm. and you've got student athletes, if you can call them that anymore, right? Yeah. That are literally from a lot of them from impoverished le- levels of society that are subject to. There's a lot of corruption that could happen, mm-hmm. and I really worry about that. Mm-hmm. Remember the old Chicago Black, yeah, socks, sure, yeah. right. So I really worry about that, and, and we don't want that because it could take down whole leagues. Yeah, it could take down whole industries, whole sports. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that develops as it's be basically adopted across the country now. It seems so. It is. I'm nervous. Ben, I answer yeah. your question. I'm nervous about that. Mm-hmm. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. yeah. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Who knows? <laughs> I hope so. Um, let's see. What was your proudest moment as a legislator? You know, proudest moment was, um, gosh, there was a lot of them, obviously, being able to help people, right, individual. But there were a lot of them, too many of them to, to, to renumerate right here. But probably the one that sticks out the most, most recently in my mind, were two. One was obviously when I was in the house, and I, I mentioned before when I was in the meadows, mm-hmm. and I was giving, it was an all-African-American audience, and we talked about vouchers then, and there was a woman that stood up, and she was an African-American teacher, and she said, you could throw all the money you want at education. You've got to focus on the home, mm-hmm. the breakup of the American family. And in particular, she was talking about the black families, mm-hmm. was th- the root of everything. And that was in 1991, and that stuck with me for all throughout my career. Yeah. And then secondly, uh, the other thing that stuck out to me was in 2000, I think, 17 or 18, we this one of the school shootings that happened down in Florida. Was it Parkland, I think? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Sounds like, yeah. I it, think, one of those in Parkland. Yeah. So we had we had literally had a town hall that happened um, uh, the day after. So all the news media was there. There were over 350 people. The, the entire church was packed. They were into the hallways, et cetera, et cetera. And so Ed Delaney, who is a fierce opponent of guns, uh, brilliant individual, very dear friend, and Kerry Hamilton, and then uh, Senator J.D. Ford had just been reelected. So he, you know, it would, been, it would have been easy for him to jump into this as a Democrat against guns, and you know, I'm going to mm-hmm. really make a name. And all these cameras are back there. And I took all three of those aside and I said, hey, guys, let's do this. There's a lot of raw emotion out there in America and a lot of raw emotion in this room right here. Why don't we do this? Each of us have a minute to maybe make a preamble, okay? But then let's take that microphone and let's spend the rest of the town hall and just pass it around and let people talk. Let's listen to them. And to their credit... Delaney, Hamilton, and J.D. Ford all agree to that. And mm-hmm. it was the most moving thing that I've ever been involved in because here was here were a lot of people that were scared. And they were obviously concerned. And some had real passions about particular issues. I get that, right, about guns, whether for or against it. But in, you have to let people vet. Mm-hmm. You have to let people have their voice. Yeah, yeah. And... It was amazing because they, you know, I went home that night and I just was exhausted because of what we'd been through. And they interviewed somebody. I'd catch it on the evening news that night, and they said, "Oh, that's the best best town hall I've ever been to. We really moved the needle." And I, that worked. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the that you've kind of gotten education almost serving the general assembly and, and kind of human psychology and human society and the complexities at play there and understanding people. Um, that's what the job, and that's right, Ben, thank you very much for bringing that up, because that's the job of an elected representative at the end of the day, right? Yeah. 90% listening, 10% talking. And unfortunately, too many of my comrades, <laughs> the other way around, right? <laughs> yeah. On both sides. Yeah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yep, that certainly happens. Right. Um, so what advice then would you give to future legislators or even current legislators? Well, like we just said, number one, listen. I would say listen probably three to one, four to one ratio, right? Let the other person, let the other constituents talk. Um, just let them talk, even if they, especially if they don't agree with you, right? Just let them talk or ask them questions. So that would be number one. Number two is seek out the other side. Don't just stay within your camp, your bubble, your echo chamber, 
Uh, literally every day, I read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, and the, the joke is, is when the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times agree on something, you got the truth, right? <laughs> and yeah. and see the other side. Look at the always look at the other side, not just your side. Make sure you do that. Make sure you get out. Empathy. Always have empathy. You know, no matter how difficult you think you have it, there's always somebody literally down the hall that's got it ten times worse than you do, mm-hmm. right? So have that. Start from there as a basis. Long term, think long term, not just short term about the next election, about the next budget, but literally think long term. You're not always going to accomplish it, right? But you got to be thinking. So, for example, one of the things we really studied was the impact. We know in Indiana that there are a million jobs we've got to replace in the next 10 years. But we not now. If we were going down that road, we'd all be worried about demographics and all kinds of things. But we now know 35% of those jobs are going to be wiped out because of artificial intelligence. So now we know of the remaining jobs, that puts more pressure downstream on our education system. Back to that integration of the Ivy Techs and the Vincennes, right? Mm-hmm. It, the high school degree is just not going to cut it anymore. It's going to take on-the-job training. It's going to take vocational education. Yeah. Right? Interesting. Um, so what, in your opinion, then, would you say is the main purpose of the General Assembly? The main purpose of the General Assembly, obviously, is education. I mean, it, mm-hmm. think about it. It's 62% in the aggregate of the budget. So it's K-12 through plus higher education and uh, Ivy Tech and Vincennes. So it's education, you know, it's your basic roads, uh, infrastructure, right? Uh, on the business side, that's always a, a, a crapshoot because you're, you're basically in Vegas, right? What do you bet on? What industries do you bet on? You know, foreign yeah. domestic or whatever, hopefully more domestic than you do. So you've got that, but it's basically that. And education, again, back to, back to the education telling Hoosiers, uh, about the realities of the world and giving them the tools and getting out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, what would you say the public does not know about the Indiana General Assembly and how it operates? <laughs> well, they all think, uh, you, you'll laugh at this story, they all think we're overpaid and, and um, don't do anything. So, for example, when I was in the House, we went to triple overtime. We, uh, there was no money and we, the budget and redistricting, so we didn't end up to June or July. Mm-hmm. We didn't finish up to July, so they wow. blasted us in the paper that um, we, you know, two hundred thousand dollars wasted and all that kind of stuff, right? Because there was a similar story about the special session, which just went through two hundred fifty thousand yeah. for the abortion issue, or whatever. So they all thought we we're overpaid, wasted money, and sitting down there and all this stuff. So literally, I had my state rep played on, and some woman, older woman, gray hair, came up right next to me at the stoplight, gave me the <laughs> finger, honked her horn. <laughs> Wow, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of the similar, sort of a mini Washington, right? Yeah. You know, I, I like my state rep, but I hate the legislature. I love my congressman. I hate Congress. Yeah. Kind yeah, of that's pretty that, nice. That's inherent. Yeah. So how would you say the... Um, how would you say the people of India have changed over the course of your lifetime culturally and... Uh, mm. Diversification, mm-hmm. uh, much more diversity. Uh, you're getting in the in the urban areas, uh, central Indiana, obviously, right? And this is really what's going on. It's a microcosm of America. And that's why I, I think if you look at this from a 90,000-foot level, when these cultures are coming together, right, mm-hmm. uh, and it's like templates and plates, they're just friction, right? So that's why you have a lot of this socioeconomic strife that you do right now. We had this 100, 110 years ago when literally the Poles, the Slavs, the Eastern Europeans all emigrated to the United States, right? Mm -hmm. They happen to be the same skin color, but you remember all the little Italian neighborhoods and all the, everything that went after them and you guys couldn't, you couldn't mix within, you can't marry an Italian, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. You know, et cetera. So same thing happened 110 years ago. It's just these plates and these cultures learn, and they will. They'll learn to integrate, and they'll learn to live together, and then we'll go to the next level. Yeah. So that's kind of what's going on in Indiana. We're getting a lot more of that in northwest Indiana. The double tracking of the South Shore Railroad will be one of the most transformative 
events investment-wise in, in Indiana history hmm. because you'll have more people moving out of Chicago and living in northwest Indiana for yeah. multiple, multiple reasons. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So that... What hasn't changed about the people of Indiana? Ah, their spirit. Yeah. Hoosiers care. <laughs> Hoosiers care. You know, if there's ever... Uh, glad you asked that one because if there's ever a catastrophe, if there's ever a crisis or disaster or something all the way down to the grand granular level what happened to us when our son was injured i mean hoosiers just pitch in Mm -hmm. and i can't tell you how many tuna casseroles i had stacked up on my kitchen counter right Mm -hmm. that's just who hoosiers are they're they care at the end of the day they're emphatic yeah yep that didn't change it never will um final question then for you uh what do you want the people of India to know about their influence on the General Assembly? Stay involved, stay active. Um, be sure, well, number one, get to know their rep or their senator. Mm-hmm. I would say, and it's a two-way street, right? Because the legislator needs to seek out and be exposed, having town halls, uh, having constituent coffees, uh, greeting them at the state house even up to in the grocery store or whatever. But it's a two-way street because the constituents need to be engaged. Constituents, A, need to know who their representatives are, right, and need to seek them out. Go to the town halls. They should. The legislators should be having them, right? Go down to the legislature and watch a, a hearing, right, physically. Be at the state house. Sit up in the gallery. It's fascinating, right? Or watch it online. Now it's extremely interesting, and extremely easy to point and click, right? So it's a two-way street. Get engaged. Yeah. Well, that's all the questions I have for you. Is there anything that I didn't ask about that you oh. want to mention, or did we cover it all for the most? This part? is it, man. This is fantastic. I mean, <laughs> we you you've seen as you probably interviewed a lot of people. There's been a lot of colorful people. Oh sure, yeah. <laughs> That, that, that you bring in the door, right? And we've all yeah. got great stories about who we serve with. And yeah. Yeah, on both sides of the aisle, doesn't matter what rural and urban. And, you know, it's it's people. At the end of the day, yep. it's people. Yeah, pretty much. Right? Yeah. Well, thank you for doing this.